Uh, good afternoon. Um, on a snowy day, a snowy afternoon here in Davos, uh, to everybody online, thank you for joining us, everybody in the room. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is not uh, Henry Kissinger's session, so if anybody... <laughs> uh, but this is very much a 21st century uh, question. And I'm really pleased that the, the forum has uh, brought us together on this subject. The, the issue of uh, all of the transitions necessary in, um, in order to combat the climate crisis and to reset our relationship with nature. Um, there are, these sessions are sprinkled across the agenda all week. It's very much a mainstream topic here. But there are some absolutely critical dependencies if we are going to uh, make these transitions smoothly and in time. Uh, critical dependencies if we are going to have that revolution in renewable energy, which is the sort of precursor of the energy transition. And one of the most important dependencies is um, having the jobs and the skilled workforce necessary to be able to, 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 to drive that forward. Now, the World Economic Forum has for a number of years uh, been working on this and conducting uh, research, which is, is, is very, very important. I think it's going to go up on the screen in a minute. This work's really important because in and around the Paris uh, Agreement, just, just five, six, seven years ago, I think everybody was sort of saying, well, you know, there's no jobs in the transition or there aren't. Nobody knew what we meant by a green job. Nobody knew exactly whether there was going to be more or less. Obviously, there are geographic inconsistencies. Some areas are going to have to re-identify uh, re themselves, perhaps from being coal mining or coal communities to being something else. And, and of course, there's a generational slip, uh, shift. So I'm really, I think the WEF's done really important and, and very high-quality work in this area, really looking at what is a green job and then where, where are the green jobs going to be. And this isn't just about energy. It's not just about no more coal, you know, going to solar panels. It's in every sector of the economy that we're seeing a shift. And so up on the screen, you've just got a, a screenshot of, of just the enormity, really, of uh, the, um, the shift that we have to make, but the extraordinary opportunity in a world which has very young populations in very important countries around the world, that, that, that there is really something to be very excited about. Of course, getting this into the rhetoric of our political leaders so that they're talking about these opportunities and then actually putting policies in place to make this happen with some of the stuff we're going to talk about now. So I'm going to, we've got a very distinguished panel um, who've got a lot to say coming from different dimensions uh, of, of the problem. So I, first of all, I'm going to go to Alan Blue from LinkedIn. Um, and I think that you've probably got the uh, greatest vantage point uh, or an extraordinary vantage point. You can see across uh, this whole issue. And it would be great if you could kick us off with, you know, talk about the demand that you see and then how we can respond mm -hmm. to that. Um, absolutely. So <clears throat> thanks, everybody. Good to see you all, and thank you for having me. Um, so LinkedIn, we have about 875 million users in our network, and each person provides a profile publicly um, about what they do and what they know. Plus, hundreds of thousands of companies post jobs on LinkedIn. So we have a pretty good idea of the supply and demand when we analyze all of that data, which is where our information comes from. Um, a few years ago, we began breaking up the skills which were on people's profiles and in people's and in the job descriptions, and we identified a bunch of them as green skills. So basically, we have a handful of jobs which we call fully green jobs. These are the ones which are unique to the non-carbon economy, um, and they include obvious things like solar panel installation and so forth. Um, that's actually a very small collection of the jobs. And even the research that you can read, if you look at the QR code, um, we're actually looking at probably 1% of the jobs that exist in the world. The vast majority of jobs that are going to be affected by the transition are, in fact, these greening jobs, where basically a job that we're all very familiar with right now becomes a little bit different, in some cases a lot different, from what it is right now. So the skill mix for a given job shifts to include a set of green skills. So it was a surprise to me, but the fastest growing green skill on LinkedIn is, <clears throat> is, um, is in fashion. Um, so basically, eco-conscious fashion is uh, the, the one which has grown 263% in the last five years. 
That's an example of a job which we might be familiar with, but which is becoming new and different. Across the entire set of jobs we look at, we see roughly between five and a half and 11% on average growth year over year in terms of demand. But we see slightly less than that in terms of growth of supply of workers who actually have those skills. So in a place like renewables, um, so uh, energy renewables, where we see a 90% increase, this is well outside that cent that average amount, um, we don't see, um, we see only uh, roughly a 70% increase in the number of people who have those skills. So it's a, it's a challenge that we see where basically the supply is growing, if you will, arithmetically, but the demand is growing exponentially. And as we begin to break ground on more of the things we need to do, as we mitigate climate change and move to the non-carbon future, the demand is only going to increase. And what we're talking about today is how do we meet that demand? So that's a perfect segue to, commit, to the Commissioner, Commissioner Nicholas Schmidt, uh, Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights. So uh, a fascinating brief. <laughs> So obviously you're the commission, you're not, uh, you have a, a, a beautiful and varied collection of member states. Um, <laughs> so, and, and, and the EU has very aggressive uh, targets. Um, there's some that would say they're not aggressive enough, but they are aggressive targets for uh, the climate uh, transition or the, uh, the green energy transition in particular. So how do you, how do you think as the commission about moving uh, the European workforce to the point where it can deliver on those targets. Yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to participate in uh, this very fascinating debate on, on, on really an issue which, uh, which uh, is of uh, utmost importance. Now, I, I just wanted to say first that, uh, remember, uh, uh, with the green jobs, it's a bit like uh, the same thing uh, as it was with digital. Uh, when the whole digital process started, uh, there was they, this process was conceived or presented as a big threat. And the same thing is about the greening of our economy. It's a threat for normal jobs. We will use millions of jobs. Now we know, uh, at least we, we have the impression, nor the digital, nor the greening of our economy will be a, a process of uh, losing millions of jobs. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there will be jobs lost, mm -hmm. but especially there will be a lot of jobs created, different jobs, and there, that's the point, that's the problem, and there will be a transformation of many of uh, uh, the jobs which exist already today, and you mentioned it. Uh, the purely green jobs well, probably they are relatively limited. When I look at the list, well, it has disappeared now. Uh, well, even those who are installing heat pumps or uh, solar panels, well, they have some kind of basic electricity uh, 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 skills. Mm -hmm. They uh, did some other jobs before, and now they have to be trained on this particular job of uh, installing heat pumps or, or, or solar panels. Now, what the Commission is doing is now that we say, well, this transition will not be automatic. We have to accompany it to make it successful and to make, to make it beneficial for everybody. So we have to take away this impression of threat, but we have to transform the threat into huge opportunities. And giving people the, the feeling and also the certainty that we are there to help them to, uh, uh, to, to, to enter into this new world, be it the green world as I think also the digital one. By the way, digital and green, there are a lot of connections yeah. Yeah. Uh, in between. Mm -hmm. So I think this is what we call the just transition. And skills, skilling people, uh, helping them to find new jobs or to be able to do their transformed jobs in many areas, this is what we try uh, to put very much uh, uh, forward. Well, as I said, I think this morning already, we mobilized 750 or even the president said 800 billion euros uh, to accompany this transformation, green and digital. And part of that is also reskilling people. 
And we have a fund uh, with, uh, I think, about 20 billion, which is transition fund, which we have focused mainly on regions. You have mentioned coal, and we all know that in the US, the coal regions have been affected a lot uh, by closing the coal mines. Uh, to say, no, we will close this, but we will help you immediately to transform this with new activities. And I think this is what uh, the policy is all about, and working with member states, working with regions, to show that there is a life, there is a job, there is a, uh, a future beyond the traditional energy or a traditional activity. We can help uh, uh, these uh, activities to be transformed or replaced. That's what we are doing in Poland a lot. We can give these workers new opportunities in renewable energy, but also uh, we have uh, an enormous challenge uh, in renovating buildings, because even with uh, 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 renewable energy, we still have to be a bit uh, more focused on energy saving. And so renovating our buildings, for instance, is a big challenge. There are billions, millions of buildings that have to be renovated, and we do not have the skilled people to do it. So I think there is a, a, an issue where we put a lot of money in training people for these jobs, taking them from other uh, uh, activities away, giving them good opportunities to find a new job in this uh, example. That's what we try to discuss with uh, all kinds of stakeholders, member states first, but also regions. We are very much focused on the regions in Europe, especially those affected by the transformation, building up alternatives and uh, bringing and taking people along. I think this, is, this transformation will only be successful and without too much uh, um, turmoil if we convince people that this is a, a good opportunity for them and they will not be, at the end, the losers of it. It's not the globalization. The problem with globalization was a lot of people felt to be the losers of glo globalization, and I need not insist on the consequences of that. This time, we really have to show that uh, there are a lot of good opportunities. By the way, while all these calculations are a bit, uh, uh, well, are interesting, but nobody knows, we think that millions of new jobs can be created, but we have to do that to skill people and to, uh, uh, to uh, have the right investments in these new activities. That's what the Commission is accompanying and uh, uh, pushing member states into that direction. So this is very interesting because there's a clear, a clear role, uh, well, a clear role from the policy point of view that there is a role in communicating to the public and to them going in hand in hand with member states, with regions, but also I assume companies with the private also. sector. Absolutely, right? companies. Mm -hmm. Well, that's absolutely necessary that we take companies along and, and work uh, closely with the diff You know, we have organized now the economy in 14 big sectors and nearly all sectors are uh, impacted by the greening, by the uh, uh, tr green transformation. And so we have to work with these sectors, be it agriculture, be it tourism, be it automotive. We all know big transformation uh, towards the electric uh, cars. So, and working with companies and also with the unions, because uh, people accept to be retrained if they understand the purpose, mm -hmm. if they understand where we will lead them. Then I think uh, because reskilling or skilling is also a mindset issue. And this is probably the most difficult yes. one. And uh, this is also what we try to discuss with all the stakeholders uh, in this context. So let's segue to then the, the private sector partners. So to Elizabeth Gaines, so you're a company in transition as well. Um, so a resources company leading through the transition. What is the um, skills, the access to the skills and talent that you need? How do you view it? And, how do you see the partnership also then back with government on that? Mm. Well, thanks, Rachel, and, and good to be here this afternoon. Look, uh, uh, you know, Fortescue, for those who are not that familiar with us, I mean, we're one of the largest iron ore producers in the world. We're regarded as a resources company, but in fact, we're transitioning to be a resources and renewable energy company, and we intend to generate renewable energy. Green hydrogen is the key focus. So that in itself is a significant transition for our company. In addition to that, we've made the decision to achieve net zero, uh, real zero emissions by 2030 by eliminating the use of fossil fuels 
throughout our mining operations. So that is a big commitment. And, and basically what, what that will do is it, it will eliminate the, the use of about a billion litres of diesel every year through our mining operations. Now to do that, we have to take our workforce on a journey with us and we will have to retrain and reskill people uh, that's going to be critically important. We're going to go from a mining operation that relies on 24-7 fuel um, availability, fossil fuel at the moment, to renewable energy. We'll have to go to more of a demand management model uh, and that, that will require change right across the sort of 20,000 strong workforce. We do have a track record of taking our workers through significant transformation. A number of years ago, we made the decision to... Um, to adopt autonomy for all of our mining haul fleet. And that means that we've taken drivers out of those haul trucks. We now have a fully autonomous mining fleet, the biggest in the world. And we had to take those workers on that transition with us. And we did that. We didn't make anybody redundant. We didn't, no one lost their job. We retrained, we reskilled, we showed people that there were new jobs, that they had some, some already had some skills but we did need to invest heavily and we had to work with government and we had to work with the education institutions as well to make sure that we were actually on a pathway that would take a workforce to a much more digitised, uh, data-driven mining operation. And that's been very successful. So I think the track record is there, um, but the transition we're on at the moment will fundamentally change the skills of a number of those workers. Um, We've got a good core base that we can retrain and reskill, but we still need the workers of the future as well. And because of the ambitions we have and the investment we're making in new technologies, that means that we also need a different skill set. And that's been important for us working with, with government, working with those education institutions. Um, the concern is it's not happening at exactly the pace that we want it because our goal is um, to eliminate emissions by 2030. Here we are in 2023. The, the, the clock is ticking. So we really have to make sure that we don't see the um, availability of skills as a roadblock to that transition because you know, we're absolutely committed to that transition. We think it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. We see energy costs increasing, the introduction of other, whether it's carbon charges or other um, costs that are not currently across our organisation. So this is a way of mitigating risk in the future. But we have to make sure that we have the workers that we need. It's, it's not easy. Um, where I think for a, for a large industrial company, we're actually ahead of the curve. So we've, we're already identifying these challenges and working with providers. The good thing is that our workers are really energised by what we're doing. The goal to decarbonise our operations has 100% support right across our entire workforce, regardless of the fact that some of those skills and trades will no longer be required because we won't need a diesel mechanic. We'll need somebody who can work on a battery electric truck. And so they, they will need to be reskilled and retrained. But there's absolutely a, a real sense of commitment right across the workforce. And we're attracting new talent because of the ambitions of our goal. So people who actually don't want to work in the heavy emitting industries anymore that actually want to be part of a, a company that is, is transitioning rapidly we're actually attracting that talent. So that's, you know, but we want everyone to share in this because this is a global challenge. It's not just a challenge for us. It's, it's a global challenge, a global transition. So we do need to work closely with regulators. In Australia, there is good government support as well because we operate in regional areas. Um, the commissioner talked about the coal industry. We've seen in Australia, the coal industry, very strong government support to provide retraining and reskilling opportunities uh, in our country for people who are going to be impacted by the energy transition. Coordinating all of that is a role that business can play and we're certainly taking the lead on that but we are working very closely with regulators. But attracting talent isn't so much the issue but getting the right skills at the time that we need it is obviously still a challenge but we're making good progress. If, before I go to Paddy, so when you, so you're a big employer, especially in the areas where you're operating, right? You mm. must be the biggest employer in the local area in many cases. So when you talk to uh, provincial government, state government, and and the national federal government, are, are they listening to you when you say, look, you know, this is how we see, this is how we see the talent pipeline. This is what our needs are going to be. I mean, is there? How, where's the level of the debate at the moment in Australia? 
Well, we had a change of federal yeah. government last year, and, and I think, firstly, we've got a much more ambitious climate change agenda in Australia. So I think that's a, that's a positive. The government is engaging with business. I think the alignment of skills and the availability of those skills is not as advanced as the, the broader climate targets, and that's a role that we as business can play. I don't think there's any issue with getting access to the right people to have those discussions. I mean, Australia is actually in a fantastic position to create a new export market of renewable energy because mm -hmm. we have an abundance of renewable mm -hmm. energy and no government in Australia wants to miss out on that opportunity. Um, you know, coordinating between federal government and then the various states, uh, again, that, that requires um, some level of coordination. So we're not there yet, it's not perfect, but I think the ambition's there, we've got the right, we're getting the right policy settings in place and we as business can play a role in making sure that we can coordinate with government. And there is, and the doors are open, so we can have those discussions and I think that's, that's really important. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, so, Paddy Pamathan from Aqua. So, you've been on the leading edge of the uh, <laughs> green energy transition uh, for a number of years, right? So, talk to us about as as a company that's been investing in renewable energy. On that, talk about the the energy industry itself. So, it's got to reskill as a as an industry. Every company is facing this, and then, you know, I think it's quite well known that some of the companies that are identified with the sort of fossil fuel energy industry have problems to recruit in certain markets as well. But how do you see, how do you see from the energy sector, how do you see this all playing out? Um, thank you, delighted to be here. A lot of the conversation out there is about um, increasing interest rates, rampant inflation, supply chain constraints, geopolitical tensions. Uh, what are we gonna do with energy transition? The real concern that we have is I think the skill issue is being grossly, grossly underestimated. Mm -hmm. This 66% that I see there is to do with certain sectors. We need to step back and think about the enormous amount of capacity ramp up that is needed for components that needs to go into the renewable energy systems, the, the inputs that then go into those components all the way back to the, so coal mining finished. We need to ramp up zinc mining mm -hmm. at a phenomenal rate. We need to, don't, people don't talk about zinc, it's all about copper. Copper, yes, there are so many metals and minerals and it's not an issue of they're not there, it's just that we need to set up the mines, we need to employ the people. There is a, uh, increasing levels of automation coming, but there is a huge amount of people that's required. A significant part of energy transition is also, because the technology is there, it allows us to serve the unserved and the underserved. And it's happening. The rooftops in the middle of nowhere, they don't get put in by robots. They're put in by people who have got to be skilled, who have got to have, and it's not just putting the robots and setting the uh, payment mechanism, uh, digit, uh, the digital solutions. It's about then follow through. So there's a whole range of, it's not just about new skills, it's the, just the numbers. So I think we need to be very careful. In order to ramp up production capacity of solar panels, okay, fine, it's five years. And it's, it's happening. And we're gonna go through the same story. Uh, boom, glut, boom, fine. Um, money is enormous, a huge amount of money actually is available for the right appropriately sort of structured projects. Dealing with people issue mm -hmm. is not just five years. You can't just five years change. It's generational. We need to get training from bottom up, f from kindergarten level uh, at primary, the right kind. And, and I think there is a huge mismatch. We're not able to move fast enough to the needs of the world of today and the needs of what we can see ahead of us. We can see it now, but then it's, it takes a long time for it to feed back into the policymakers. As private sector, one of the things, I mean, so one of the things that we do, uh, Aquapa, we are growing fairly fast, renewable energy now operating in 14 countries, South Africa, right the way through Uzbekistan, Morocco, right across to Indonesia. When we, and a lot of the stuff that we do, they tend to be very large plants, 1,000 megawatt PV plant, 2,000 megawatt wind, wind farm, single, single projects. Every de investment decision we make now, in every country, 
we look at the manpower resource requirements, not just for overseeing the construction or during the construction period, but how can we maintain and manage these assets over 25 years? And put in the necessary training programs up front. When we, went, when we started to think about going to Uzbekistan as a new investment destination, we kind of take, took a decision, put in some staff, started to sort of get into the landscape. We immediately set up a training school because we recognized right up front that there was a massive technical skill shortage. Way back when we founded the company back in 2005 in Saudi Arabia, by 2007, we set up a huge training school in north of Jeddah. Uh, we churn out 500 technicians every year, 600 technicians every year, focused on, uh, on the power plant operation, desalinated plant operation. So those are the kind of things. But these are all, you know, at a, what is 600 people? We're going to need, we're going to need six million before we're done. And that is the challenge that we have. And I think we need to recognize that and we need to elevate the conversation, share the information, get people enthused, and get the young people to understand the opportunity that's ahead of us. I'm not sort of ignoring the reskilling. I think there is, of course, there is such a demand. I think that's the easiest, that's the lowest hanging fruit. Here is a bunch of people who have been doing hard work. They know how to work. They, go to, they know how to go to work you know, at the right time in the morning. So uh, reskilling them, bringing them, that, that's, it's not so straightforward, but that is the easier part than ramping up the human resource capacity. So, so notwithstanding the great work and the report that WEF has, has come out with others, we're underestimating the potential break that this could provide on the renewable energy revolution of the green, trans green transition. So we're underestimating it. The, the public debate is mainly around reskilling and sort of still very much focused on certain industries, as you were talking about, the jobs that really aren't going to exist anymore in the industries that really won't exist anymore. So this concept of the greening of jobs across every part of the economy is not well understood yet, right? Mm. I don't think any country's education system has really shifted yet. I mean, and I sort of sit managing a graduate school and I'm kind of horrified <laughs> when I sort of do my work on the, the energy transition and I look at, you know, what the curriculum is in high school and technical high schools. So where does, where does the LinkedIn industry policymaker come together to sort of provide that skills value chain, right? I mean, we've, you're saying we've got to go back to, we've got to go back to elementary school. Rishi Sunak got shot down the other day for suggesting that people needed to do math all the way through to 18 in the UK. But in a digitalized world, yes. certain data skills are kind of fundamental now for any job, even if you want to work in sustainable fashion. So how does, how does the handshake between public policy, the LinkedIn's of this world, the job markets of this world and the private sector, how, do, how does that come together? Paddy, you want to go first? Yeah, look, I, I think it can only come together by having these kind of conversations, by engaging at the right level and, and presenting the data. Okay, I think the devil is in the detail. I, I, it's very easy to talk very superficially, so we need to sit down and, and show that, look, you know, so here is a transition in your country. This is what's going to happen uh, over the next 20 years. And look at these numbers. Um, and, and if you do that, and we are doing that in the case of some countries, it's very, very obvious, the gaps. And then it's, it is very obvious how we, need to, how we can potentially start plugging the gaps. But coming back to it, I, I mean, I'm, I'm extremely, I'm an optimist, as you know, you know, the other end of optimism, as you know very well. But on this one, I'm very, I am pessimistic, mm -hmm. simply because the human side, changing mindsets is the hardest part. P taking people along with us is the most difficult part. And, and it's not about, uh, and it's getting them, starting them young and taking them forward. And for that, we need the mothers and fathers and the grandmothers and grandfathers to also support. So it's a very, it's a big publicity exercise. Uh, and we've got to really create the attention. But, it, but there's not, a, not, none I mean, of it is happening, by the way. That's but young, the this is, young people only want to work. I mean, the ones that have a choice, right? They want to work for a firm. There's, I mean, the data would seem to support that they want to work for cleaner, greener, yeah, future, modern firms. I mean, what do you see? 
I mean, is that, your, is that generation going to drive things <coughs> faster? Or we need to provide them with the, the skills to get there. So it's already shown up in the data that people who are in Gen Z and the millennial generation have a greater um, uh, concentration of green skills across all the different age groups that LinkedIn looks at. So absolutely, there are people in these age groups who are seeking this kind of work because it's, a, it's part of what they want to do and they realize it's a huge challenge that they are unfortunately going to bear a lot of the responsibility for solving. Um, I think there is a, perhaps, a parallel to be drawn between the kind of demand that we are seeing in the green skills world and the kind we saw, <clears throat> to your point about digitalization, in the, uh, basically the technology boom and what it meant for the job market in that space. So first, it meant that people were paid a lot more money mm -hmm. and because companies will pay to get the talent they absolutely need. Um, second thing is actually there were uh, alternative pathways to get into technology jobs because technology firms realized that if they just used the existing structures, it was never going to work, right? The third thing is it spawned a collection of training institutions, yeah. which we've all heard about, the coding boot camps, the, you know, the, the Google certificates, et cetera, these things which basically only existed because there was such a strong demand for a particular set of skills. And then finally, um, companies who are working in technology are willing to hire based on skills alone and skip questions around degrees and certifications and so forth. Just because they need the, tech, they need the people who can do the work, they're willing, to over, they're willing to look beyond the normal signals they would pay attention to. This is actually a tremendously valuable thing. And in LinkedIn, we actually see expansions of the talent pool by factors of 10 when you get outside the standard degree model. The number of people who suddenly become potential candidates for a role just jumps incredibly. Those are all things which were discovered in trying to solve the problem of how do I get enough engineers to come work with me at Google. So there's a... I think there's hope yeah, yeah. that those kinds of systems, and, and to be clear, I mean, organizations like yours, like Infosys and so forth, have set up training academies to be able to turn, turn people out as well. Infosys has amazing facilities for building, like building tech talent. So there's lots of possibilities. The only other thing I would mention in terms of like the overlap with policy is that, and we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, um, it can be part of the industrial policy that governments put forward to include preparing for this kind of human resource need, for this kind of talent need. So um, if you say, well, we're putting, like the IRA did, $369 billion into the world of, uh, of, of climate, maybe there's another $50 billion, which we can put into making sure that we're building up the the, the set of human resources that are necessary to enable the transformation. And I'll just add one more note. Sorry, I've been going on a long time. One more note. When you look at the distribution of the green skills around the world, they are unsurprisingly vastly concentrated in the global north and in the richest countries in the world, right? So, so much needs to happen in the global south. And I think you can even make an argument that it is possible to structure investment deals, maybe working with the, I mean, I'm not putting them on the spot, but mm -hmm. with the IMF or the World Bank or whoever's investing in making sure that we're building infrastructure to include training and yeah. skilling as a component. So ac across the EU, so you've, you've got, you've, I mean, famously we've got, you know, parts of, parts of the world that were the heartland of the old energy economy, right? And then we've gone, and now with renewable energy, and you were talking about the last mile first, right? Get it. This is, this is ubiquitous, right? I mean, obviously there are renewable energy superpowers as well um, because of their solar resources or whatever, but the technical skills, the digitalized skills for energy efficiency, the, the, the retrofitting, I mean, these things will be ubiquitous, but how does it, do you see do you see that you could sell the message of this green jobs transition in a way that overcomes the fact that it normally gets boiled down into well this region of this country is going to be a loser 
Um, and yes, the winners might be younger or they might be in another region. I mean, can you, at a European scale, can you, can you manage that? Yeah, I think this is a, a major concern. This, that's a, an absolute priority, uh, not to provoke uh, uh, disruptions and uh, more uh, fragmentation also between regions. And especially, we all know when regions when, uh, are in decline all over, uh, it's very difficult uh, to rebuild. It takes a long time to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And then you have a lot of problems because people leave, the young leave, uh, and, and to relaunch a region, uh, to rebuild an, 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 an economic uh, basis in a region which has been in decline is, is, is really, and we see it in Europe, we see it very clearly in the US and in some other countries. This is really an, an issue. And that's what we want to try to avoid. And this is the message to the regions, that there are new opportunities which have to come immediately, which we have to integrate into our plan immediately, not saying, OK, we have to close and then we would see. No, we have to deal immediately with uh, the alternatives. I, I was in Eastern Germany, which is a very special area also in political terms and sensitiveness. Uh, and, and, and there are coal mines which will be closed. But they are working now on the replacement, especially in renewables. And finally, the people working in the coal mines and some in the, the big uh, uh, energy uh, uh, facilities, well, they can relatively easily be retrained. But you have to make sure that people get this confidence that there will be a life after their present job. Not for them only, by the way, also for their kids. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the mindset issue which we have really to take care of. I, I just want to add, I fully agree with the extension to our neighbors in the south. Because I think this is, we cannot just think that we are, uh, we will be successful on, on, on this transformation. And then the south, they have to deal and try to. I think first they have a lot of opportunities now. They have the sun, which is very often there, where they have all kinds of renewable resources. And uh, this will allow us to build new partnerships, by the way. Hydrogen is one, electricity. Well, now, why not import electricity? There are plans to import electricity from Morocco through big uh, uh, solar panel farms. So I think there, there are a lot of opportunities also to rebalance the development and especially with uh, countries in the south, be it in Asia, but also especially for the Europeans in Africa. So because if we are not doing it, uh, we will have other problems. So I think this is some, something uh, which I fully agree. And this means we have to skill these people. We have to skill them, by the way, bringing them to Europe, skilling them here or skilling them over there, and then develop uh, in partnership all these activities. So I think this uh, has to go together. Uh, Europe, one thing, but also our partnerships uh, with our neighbours. So I'm just going to take. I'm going to come back to you, Elizabeth, towards the closing. But I just open it up. Are there any questions from the audience? Any comments? Any major employers? Anybody going through an identity shift? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Elizabeth, as you as you go from being a resources company to being a renew a renewable energy company that has a resource uh, component, I mean. Can you, my, my, I mean, in the mining communities that I know, in the mining communities I've worked in, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a deep part of the identity, right, the relationship to the, to the mines. So with, with the better jobs, better paid jobs, uh, cleaner jobs, better conditions or whatever sometimes for these jobs, do you think you could be as important a part of a community as you become a renewable energy powerhouse as you were a, a mining company or a resource company? We're already seeing really strong engagement at a community level. We're already installing large-scale renewable energy in areas of remote Western Australia that haven't had uh, renewable energy. So we've had to engage with the traditional custodians of the land. Uh, there's the whole regulatory approvals process, environmental approvals. So it's a complex process. And to get through that, you actually need community support because otherwise people could object to those applications. So we're finding that there is very strong community engagement and a recognition that this will create the jobs of the future. 
and it will also obviously change the uh, the climate outlooks. So I'm I, so I'm I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm, I tend to be an optimist around the um, support for this transition. I think that globally there's a recognition that this is occurring and that there this, this can be quite rapid. I think we are a, in an interesting decade with that volatility of energy prices, the security of energy supply. Um, you know, it, it's the last two years alone have made people really rethink some of those questions. Um, and even in Australia, we're seeing you know, increases in the cost of, of energy, not probably as acute as, as we've seen here in Europe, obviously. But so it's, it's very, it's, it's high on everyone's agenda. Communities do um, obviously get behind anything that will create local jobs. Uh, mining has been a really important part of the Australian economy. But I, but I tend to agree that this is, the opportunities with renewable energy are truly global. It's not as though there's an, you know, there's an iron ore precinct in Western Australia where we operate and, and our competitors operate. But renewable energy is much more broadly dispersed and it's global. So I think we've got a really good opportunity to make sure that those other parts of the globe also benefit from this transition, that we do provide those opportunities. We work with other governments. And I'm, I, I have a view that communities will really get behind these, these opportunities because it is much more, um, um, I guess, equally dispersed, not entirely equal, but it's not as concentrated as some of those resource operations which only really occur in certain regions. So I do think that this is a broader uh, global opportunity that will provide that platform to create probably that more just transition. Um, finding the people to do that and training those people does require an enormous discipline and you, know, you need to take communities on that journey. We do that currently in our mining operations. We provide entry, levels, en entry level jobs. We have programs, training academies for those, for those people for a guaranteed job. Uh, in the mining sector, if they complete the course. So it's getting beyond that sort of university style. It's yeah. about not even uh, qualified trades. This is entry level. But once we find people are in the, um, in the industry, then you know, they, they really come along. And, and from a community's perspective, that's been incredibly important. So, so that we, if we just break this down, we can see all of these component parts of, of what it's going to take to build a, a value chain of talent that's going to be on stream at the right time, in the right place for, for these incredible transitions. But that's an extraordinarily complicated uh, dance between the public sector, the private sector, the education and training sector, and everybody else in between. And I think uh, you know, there's some pretty big questions that we haven't addressed on this panel, which we'll also have to address in future WEFs and whatever, which is that Sometimes the talent, right, the youthful populations are in some parts of the world and the graying populations are in others. And so there is a sort of talent across boundaries uh, issue here as well. And I think in very few jurisdictions in the world, very few countries in the world, is that sort of immigration, migration debate coming together with this talent debate. So more work for us to do. But um, the extraordinary uh, opportunity of new jobs many of the jobs we haven't even been able to think of today. I have a 17-year-old mm. son filling in his college applications at the moment. I'm like, we have no idea uh, what the jobs you may be doing in 10, 15, 20 years look like. Some of them we will, some of them we won't. So the excitement around that opportunity, but making sure that that, that skills development is in the curriculum from, from elementary all the way through, and then this sort of handshake between uh, technical education, uh, the curriculum in public education and private education, all the way through then to what the private sector is saying about what kind of needs and demands it wants. And then, you know, uh, I think the, the, the sort of non-formal piece of it, like the, the, the apprenticeship, but even outside of apprenticeship, just making sure you've got skills ready uh, as demand grows will be very important. Uh, I work in, uh, I, I run a graduate school in the northeast of the United States where most of the investment coming into the offshore wind sector is coming from Europe and Asia. And you know, one of the breaks on investment is going to be you know, if they can't access the talent pipeline. So this, uh, this is something that we see universally. But the World Economic Forum has brought together a jobs consortium. 
um, uh, follow this and check in with this. So this is an attempt to bring together public sector, private sector, and the education sector around uh, solving these problems in real time, or at least improving the quality of the dialogue. But I think as we get ready to uh, continue the conversations here at WEF, and we look at, at the future uh, of what we do with this uh, Jobs of Tomorrow report, you can see that um, we cannot allow this to be a binding constraint on a revolution uh, in our economies, because it's going to be a great thing. Um, and so we've got, we've got a lot of, I think, hustle, hustle to do in order to make sure we can, um, we can move forward. Please thank the panel, a uh, great panel. Good luck, all of you. And thank you very much for coming to the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.